my name is Daisy. I'm an iOS developer based in New York City, and I'm here today to talk to you about a topic that's not so mainstream in iOS development, digital signal processing. What is digital signal processing, also commonly known as DSP? Here are a number of categories where DSP has revolutionized in science and engineering. Digital, digital signal processing is distinguished from the unique type of data it uses. Signals. In most cases, these signals originate as sensory data from the real world visual images, sound waves, and more. DSP is the mathematics, the algorithms, and techniques used to manipulate these signals after they've been, conver been converted into a digital form. This includes a wide variety of goals, such as enhancement of visual images, recognition of speech, and more. Suppose we attach an analog to digital converter to a computer to acquire a chunk of real-world data. DSP answers the question, uh, the next step. What's next? That being said, DSP techniques can be learned and used without the traditional barriers of mathematics and heavy theory. As software engineers, we're always learning new technologies and how to adapt these technologies in a pragmatic way. By the end of this talk, I want you to have an understanding and sense of how to use DSP and maybe experiment with your own ideas. This talk will sp specifically focus on audio analysis and how we can use Swift to represent sound through audio signals. Some practical examples we can think of when it comes to audio processing is video conferencing, the feedback we hear from dialing a phone number, or syncing your audio system in your home to reduce noise and interference. Or that first time you tried on a great pair of noise-canceling headphones. Or even the way your Amazon Echo is trained to respond to Alexa. These are all examples of digital signal processing. Now that we have some background on DSP, let's take it a step further. Consider the music we stream every day. Digital music could not exist without the Fourier transform. Before we analyze what the Fourier transform is, let's break it down to how we experience sound. This is what happens when a stream of water is exposed to a very loud 24 hertz speaker recorded at 24 frames per second. The sound can be thought of as some of various sine waves or pure tones. Any sound or signal can be represented as a collection of sine waves with the right frequency and phase. By mapping out the frequencies in the sound, you, come up, you build up the fundamental components of sine waves it contains. This map is a Fourier transform of sound. If we iterate through this collection at different frequencies, we come up with all of its components. We've now gone from an individual samples, which tells us very little, to a comprehensive map of the audio. The Fourier transform is essentially what your ear does with incoming sound, so it's a much better match for human perception. And we hear sound by frequencies, not samples. So how do we use DSP in iOS apps? The Accelerate framework is a hidden gem within the iOS SDK. It's used to make large-scale mathematical computations optimized for high performance. It's composed of a variety of CAPIs for matrix math, digital signal processing, and image manipulation. It's also where we can find VDSP, a library with C and Swift APIs for performing a number of functions related to digital signal processing, including Fourier transforms. The VDSP APIs provides Fourier transforms for transforming one-dimensional and two-dimensional data between the time and frequency domain. It's sometimes preferable to visualize frequency and visualize data in the frequency domain. So that's what I'll show you today. In this example, I've used AV audio engine and audio units separately to show you fundamental differences. If you're familiar with AV foundation, then just think of AV audio engine and audio unit as the API for complex audio processing. My core example in includes AV audio engine. It was introduced back in 2014 and simplifies real-time low latency real-time real low latency audio. Lastly, this is simply theoretical, but essential to core audio processing, the sampling theorem, otherwise known as shannon nyquist sampling theorem. In order to get a good signal, we need to sample at least twice the frequency that it is. Nyquist says that if we have 4,000 kilohertz in our, as our highest frequency in our band-limited channel, we'd have to sample at least twice the frequency that it is to get all the fidelity and avoid any aliasing. At this rate, we have a much better chance of getting a quality sound. AV Foundation is quite powerful. There are a variety of ways we can process audio data. The AV Audio Engine class manages the graph of nodes, then the input, output, and main mixer nodes. If we go a layer beneath, we will find the Audio Unit API, which can be used as an internal rendering block for caching. There's a variant here called Real-Time Manual Rendering Mode, where we get the ideal effects of processing truly real-time audio data. But we cannot safely do this in Objective-C or Swift. However, instead, the engine itself provides 
provides a render block where you can search and cache and then later use that render block in a real-time context. Here's a 2017 WWDC video that gives a more elaborate explanation on real-time audio processing. Here are some notable projects that have been dedicated to providing fast and efficient solutions for audio processing on iOS, macOS, and even tvOS. AudioKit is a Swift framework wrapped around EV audio engine that calls down into Objective-C, C++, all the way down to pure C. It also uses the audio unit API that we saw earlier in that breakdown of AV Foundation. The internals also use some of the legacy works from the Easy Audio library listed here. Usually audio development is decoupled from mobile development, although we're provided with all the APIs. It's definitely no doubt that tapping into these APIs is not exactly easy to implement. But audio and iOS are incredibly fun to work with. These frameworks like Audio Unit and Accelerate don't get much notoriety because of its obscure APIs. I think the purpose of this conference is to inspire creativity and see how we can leverage overlooked features in Swift. So let's see what we can implement in pure Swift. The steps that we'll take is capturing audio input, processing it, and displaying some unique points in the spectrum, aka the FFT. So we know that we're offered AV Audio Engine within AV Foundation. So let's say we have a separate class called Audio Listener, where we'll invoke and instantiate our audio engine. This is by no means production ready and solely done to achieve a quick and fast implementation. So at initialization, we start the audio session. We've set the default hardware sample rate and preferred IO buffer duration. We want to extract 1,024 samples to display in the spectrum. Once the session is active, we can set up the audio engine. Here the audio engine is instantiated and the frame length is set to twice the sampling rate, 2,048. We can now install a tap on the audio bus and set it up with some raw audio data in PCM format. PCM just simply stands for pulse code modulation. In other words, our sampled audio signals. What's happening in this closure here installs a tap on the audio bus to record, monitor, and observe the output of the node. We then set the audio's buffer single channel data pointer with values iterated through that frame length. And to stop the engine, we have a helper function that removes the tap on the audio bus. Great, we have our audio listener class now. How can we represent that raw PCM data into a spectrum? To maybe see peaks of amplitude and magnitude? Well, as discussed earlier, we'll need to compute an FFT to achieve that. Here's where we'll need the Accelerate framework. I know what you're thinking. This may seem overly complex for a simple Swift implementation, but we're Swift experts, right? So we can do this. We've completed step one by capturing the audio input. Now let's move on to step two and process it. Here we'll perform a forward FFT on the provided single audio channel data. To boost performance, VDSP functions that process in the frequency domain expect a weights array of complex exponentials prior to calling the function. Once created, this FFT weights array can be used over and over again by the same Fourier function. When complete, this instance can be queried for analysis or for fetching the magnitudes. Our buffer size will be the frame length of the audio data. This variable here, log 2n, is the base 2 logarithm of n, where n is the number of circular computations on our buffer. It also specifies the largest number of elements that can be processed in the subsequent Fourier function. Log 2n must equal or exceed any arguments applied to any any argument, sorry, log 2n must equal or exceed the arguments applied to any functions using the weights array, which is our buffer size. This is why we have that bitwise left shift operator. Functions automatically adjust their strides throughout the array when the table has more resolution or larger n than required. Then we have our input count, which is half of our sampling rate. FFT weights array are created by calling VDSP create FFT setup for single precision or double precision. Before calling any function that processes in the frequency domain, this is required. Next, we'll create our complex split value to hold the output of the transform. DSP split complex is the data type to define in the VDSP library that simply has two components, real and imaginary. The output of a Fourier, trans Fourier transform is essentially a sequence of complex numbers which correspond to the two-dimensional result of the rotation procedure. 
A real array here must be transformed by the means of calling VDSP CTOS, which includes the Nyquist component that we mentioned earlier. Before we do that, we'll apply the VDSP hand window, which helps us to avoid spectral leakage. It's applying a handing window smooth as the incoming waveform and reduces errors from the output of the FFT. Since we're applying a finite Fourier transform, we're implicitly applying it to an infinitely repeating signal. So here's a caveat I came across when implementing, when implementing this without any C helpers. Handing definitely helps smooth out the frequency spectrum, but I could have achieved greater accuracy with a circular buffer. Using a circular buffer lets you process the input and output data asynchronously from its source, since the audio rendering process takes place on a high priority thread. Lastly, in this temp value towards the bottom, we have VDSP CTOS. It converts the interleaved vector from our buffer into a complex split vector, which is our output underlined in yellow. In other words, it moves the even index samples into our buffer's real components and our buffer's odd index samples into the buffer's imaginary components. And for best performance and energy efficiency, we must use a stride of two for interleaved complex data. Finally, we can compute the forward FFT since we're working in the frequency domain. If we're working in the time domain, we would compute the inverse. Once we've done that, we've released the FFT setup, and the result is our normalized magnitudes returned in an array of floats. Not so bad, right? So we've completed step two. Now with all this unique data, how do we display it? What's next? Ideally, when we have data like this, we'd want something like OpenGL or Metal, but we don't have time for that. So we'll keep it simple and use plain old UIKit. The code is simple, we just have our sample rate divided by two as the Nyquist frequency. The magnitudes in the FFT bins give us the energy of sound between different frequencies. Then we map those return, to rate, those return magnitudes in the, as the height in the UI view. I'll post the GitHub link at the end if you're interested in checking it out. So, Let's see this in action. As I'm speaking, you can probably see the peaks rendering from the extracted FFT bins. Let's try playing a song. Guitar Tokyo, if anybody's interested. <laughs> implementation was completely accurate. There is more I could have done, like convert those magnitudes into decibels, or do a high-pass filter on the audio. So what's another approach we could have taken? Another approach would have been to build an audio unit, perhaps with a circular buffer. But it definitely requires a more careful setup and a ton of error handling, as you can see here. Don't worry, this is not meant to be read. So what are the necessary, step, necessary steps to build an audio unit? Well, similarly, we'd have to configure the input and output bus configurations. Preferred I.O. buffer duration, set up the audio component, handle OS status, and set up the input and, out and recording callback struct. The list goes on, but for brevity, we won't go in depth. If you've noticed a trend here, it seems like Swift may not be the best option for audio processing. There seem to be a lot of caveats. So what is the right approach? This list comes from a developer called Mike, named Michael Tyson, 
the creator of the amazing audio engine framework that I listed earlier. He's also the creator of an app called Loopy that functions as a multi-track looper. These are mistakes he listed to avoid when doing audio development on iOS or macOS. These are solid tips, and with current tools like AudioKit, it's now easier to safely work with audio and DSP. So what's the purpose of this talk? Well, to find out how much it actually requires to tap into these APIs, and to highlight the Accelerate framework and see how quickly it was able to iterate through our thousands of samples and return back some normalized data. This is what Matt Thompson says, the author of this library called Surge, a wrapper around the Accelerate framework. Accelerate exposes SIMD instructions available on modern CPUs to improve performance of certain calculations. SIMD simply stands for single instruction multiple data. SIMD instructions allow you to perform the same operation on multiple values at the same time, which is also known as parallel programming, and is quite powerful. All of that FFT computing we did earlier comes out of the box with this API. I definitely recommend checking it out. So why should we use frameworks like Accelerate? Here are a list of benefits gained if you're thinking of integrating the Accelerate framework into your apps. 2,800 APIs, less developer maintenance, and best of all, built for efficiency. The idea behind this talk originally started by my attempt to replicate a simplified version of Shazam, the, the popular music recognition app. But when I realized I'd have to dive into audio fingerprinting and index a lot of my own music, I quickly deferred the idea. This paper behind, this is the paper behind the Shazam algorithm. It's titled An Industrial Strength Audio Search Algorithm by Avery Wang, the technical co-founder of Shazam. It's a pretty remarkable six-page publication. Audio fingerprinting is a unique identifier for a given song by matching segments of the recorded song in tokens or tuples in the presence of noise and distortion. How cool would it be to see an audio fingerprinting library? One does not exist yet. But with the steps I listed today on audio and DSP, it's definitely possible. Here's a compiled list of articles and guides I came across relevant to this talk. If you want to learn more about DSP in general or get a high-level explanation on the concepts, I recommend checking this book out, The Scientist and Engineer's Guide to Digital Signal Processing by Stephen Smith. It's available for free online an incredibly interesting read covering every possible footprint on DSP, from audio analysis to image processing. I also came across Ronald Nicholson's help on the DSP Stack Exchange site. He's incredibly knowledge knowledgeable on signal processing and how to how and his answers provide some useful information on how to integrate it into your iOS apps. Here is also Apple's conceptual VDSP programming guide for using Fourier transforms. Lastly, Mike Gash gives us a great explanation on Fourier transforms and FFTs from this article from 2012, some of which I surfaced in this talk. Although this, the examples are not updated, the concepts remain the same. And this is the link for the example I presented today. If you wanted to experiment with audio and Swift but thought it was too abstract, I hope this talk clarified some doubts. Thanks so much for listening.